so much for the opportunity to sing to you, to worship you with our voices in song. And Lord, I pray that you will take and do a work inside of our, our minds and our soul and our spirit tonight in order to help us to worship you in your word. Lord, come and meet with us. Holy Spirit, we ask you to fill this place as well as to fill us and to do a work inside of us tonight in order to honor and glorify you. In your name, Yeshua. Amen. All right, the message tonight has got a title of We Are Builders. If you brought your Bibles, let's turn to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 3, verses 9 through 15. Dolly, you don't have a Bible? Oh, that's right. I had to take yours so that I could have one up here. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 3, 9 through 15. It says... For we, and this is Paul talking, there's been a little disruption there in, in the Corinthian church, and some people are saying, I'm of Paul and other of Apollos. And Paul is addressing that issue. And he said, hey, Apollos and I, we're on the same playing field here. So there's nobody above anybody else. So he's addressing that issue. And that's who he's talking about when he says we. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's cultivated field, God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given me like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and, no, and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So, Paul is talking to us here, comparing us in previous verses that we didn't read. He was talking about planting and how that fits in the way God is working in us. But he switches. He says, we are God's cultivated field, God's building. And then he goes on with the metaphor of a building. And I'd like us to focus on that tonight. And he's making the statement here that we must each be careful, each man must be careful how he builds on it. I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but every waking moment, you are building a building in heaven with God, for God. The building he refers to is not here on earth. As a matter of fact, later on, I'll bring that scripture up. It talks that we're involved with building a building that's not made with hands. It's not something that's here or earthly. So I want to take and offer you guys some tips and some techniques tonight on how you're going to build this building. So in order to do that, every good building project has to have a building inspector. So I'll put on a building inspector hat to start us off. So in this building that's being built, there's a general contractor. It's the guy that actually owns the building, and he's the one in charge of the project. That's God. 
God's our GC. He's our general contractor. And that means that in this building project, we're what's called subcontractors. He tells us what he wants done, and we go out and we do it. So we're the subs, shortened form, subcontractor, okay? So God's really concerned with the quality of workmanship that we're going to produce for this building. Consequently, he wants us to examine ourselves and make sure that we are doing a good job, that we're ready to work, that we're diligent, and he's going to be getting the perfect product then, right? What's the building products that we're going to be using, the, the materials? It tells us in these verses. Did you remember what that was? Gold, silver, costly jewels or precious stones, wood, hay, and straw. We've got six that are listed. And in this project, we've got to kind of make this examination of this project, make sure that it's structurally sound. We don't want any raw rust, you know, the things that can end up causing problems in any building project. So we need to take, and in order to kind of work into that, to look at this building project, we actually need to kind of go back in history a little bit. So I'll put on my historian hat. It's slightly different. Now, now I can look like a historian. They all wear hats like this, right? So if you go back five or 600 years, we lived in a time when there were kings and castles there were lords and ladies, there were masters, there were servants, there was thrones, a scepter, and people knew how to bow before the king. There was royalty. And then we started migrating over to the new world, and we got a taste of freedom from the king. And that taste turned into a hunger. And God blessed us in that hunger, and through a bloody war with England, we became a free nation. And God blessed us in that. We became fruitful. We ended up being wealthy, and we honored God. We had universities, Harvard, Yale, others dedicated to training pastors, preachers. These were Christian institutions in their earliest days. So we honored God, and God continued then to bless us. And we grew. We had the whole, con the whole nation here. We became an industrial force. We were a financial powerhouse in the world. But something else happened, too. We kind of forgot our roots where we talked about kings and thrones and royalty and knowing how to bow down and what a scepter was. We instead, we became very self-sufficient. God's blessing kept pouring in. And we started to forget that God was the source of all of this blessing. It wasn't our might. It wasn't our power. But we kind of forgot that. And in our self-sufficiency, our independence, and boy, were we a, a proudly independent people. I think we still are, aren't we? We, we really value that independence and that self-sufficiency. But in valuing that, I think we have, as a society, allowed pride to come in and supplant God. So a question, what is pride? It might be better to ask, what isn't it? Because pride is kind of a 
it's more like what I'm not doing as opposed to what I am doing. Pride, quite simply boiled down, is not giving God credit where credit is due. Pride is my accepting credit for something that really isn't mine. That's in its, about its simplest terms. And it can infiltrate in pretty much any area of our life. I mean, we could have a good marriage, but we can be proud about it in such a way that we might look down on somebody that's got one that's not as good. I mean, it's insidious how it can creep in to every aspect of our life. And God has some pretty strong words about pride. It's something that very, very distasteful to us. So, here we are, years and years later down the road. And our society, as we know, he's brought his strong hand of judgment down on nations in the past who are doing no worse than what we're doing today. It's, it's amazing that he's, his patience has held back and not judged us yet. And the only way that we're ever going to escape that is through repentance. Repentance for us is a nation that's lost its way. So, some verses that apply to this is uh, some verses out of Romans. Perhaps this might sound a little bit like what we're seeing in our lives, in our society today. In Romans chapter 3, verse 14, it's talking about those who are in rebellion against God, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. And then in verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. I mean, we're, we're maybe even beyond that. We're to the point where instead of not fearing God, they rebel openly against him. They want to throw him out of everything that's of value, get him out of the schools, get him out of the government, get him out of everywhere. That's pretty open rebellion. So how does this affect us as subcontractors? We've got to go back to our inspector hat here. So how does this affect us as subcontractors? It's, a, it's just a fact that whatever society you live in exerts an influence on you. How much of an influence depends upon you. But... Everyone is subject to being influenced by the society in which they live. So this means that we need to examine ourselves to see if any of these, well, literally, if any of these sins, whether it's pride or any of the others, has infiltrated our life. And that affects us because as a subcontractor where we're building this building with God, if we have sin in our life, it has an effect on those building materials that we read about. Because as we're building, the words that we speak, the thoughts that we have, and the actions that we take every day that we are awake, all the time that we're awake, that is when these building products are being shipped up to heaven. If we're living righteously, we're doing that which is good, we're shoveling up the gold and the silver and the precious stones, we're shipping that right off up into heaven for this building project. But if we are failing, if we are sinning, 
It's like a choke point. Let's, let's, let's use our imagination a little bit right here. Let's kind of you know, maybe step into the spiritual realm mentally and go up into this heavenly area where we're in there working and we're working away and we've got this sin thing that happens, you know? Well, we just put in an order for half a ton of gold and, and a couple, couple tons of silver and, and I need 15 pallets of that precious stone. And we're busy, we're working away and man, it's been a long time. Where are my building materials? So we call up Bill. Hey, Bill, where are they at? I ordered these a week ago. What's going on? Bill says, hey, I went up there. I, I, I brought the stuff. Gate was closed. Nobody was around. I couldn't get in. I had to bring them back. Oh. Well, that's what sin does. It closes the gate. We don't get to shovel any good, valuable things into heaven for this building project when we have sin in our life. However, the wood, hay, and straw, it can still get past the gate because they bring that in with a chopper. But that stuff is all going to burn, and it doesn't really do us any good. So if we have sin in our life, there's a choke point. Now here's the other part of it. It's our motives that take and actually... Um, we can have something good. Let's say for an example. Honey, would you please take the garbage out? Okay, I'll be right there. I got a little something to finish up, but I'll be right there. Yo, so you take the garbage, you get done with your thing, you take the garbage, bring it out. Okay, got it done, honey. All right, thanks. Life's good. Same situation. Honey, would you take the garbage out? Yeah, I, I got a little something I'm going to finish first. Dadgummit, why in the world she want me to do this right now? I'm busy. Can't she see that this is important to me? And yes, I took the garbage out. Motive. That motive just shot any of the good, the gold, the silver, and the precious stones that was headed for heaven. That motive even though they did what they were supposed to do, that motive stopped the flow. So our motive is very important with what we do. So we, and, and we're the only ones that can check ourselves, really. You know, we can ask the Holy Spirit to tell us, and that's good. That's the best thing to do. But we can't rely on somebody else to come in and say, hey, you need to watch what you're doing here. That, that motive was bad, or you got that sin going on. We need to examine ourselves, just like the Lord says. So here we are, and we got this building project going on. I need to change hats again. Sometimes in a building project, a subcontractor, he gets so busy, he's working away, and everything's going. And then maybe there's a hiccup here or a hiccup there and gets behind and he needs some help. I'll be a subcontractor now. I've come to help and I'm not from the government. So, needs just a little bit of help getting things going. So, what, 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 are, what are we going to find? I have a great idea. The GC, the general contractor, he left us this huge toolbox, so let's go check it out. I think there's stuff in there we could use. So we dig around in the toolbox just a little bit, and look at what I found. He's left us some PPE. Does anybody know what in the world PPE is? Personal protective equipment. Very valuable on a job site. So he's given us some PPE. This is from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 18. It says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, arrogance, and the evil way 
and the perverted mouth I hate. And you're thinking, how in the world is this personal protective equipment? (laughs) 8.13, I'm sorry, did I say 13.8? I meant, yes, I meant Proverbs 8.13, pardon me. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverted mouth I hate. You know, for a long time, I puzzled over that verse because I felt like I really needed the fear of the Lord in my life. And I didn't feel like I had it. And I'm going, what is wrong with me? Why can't I, why can't I get a grasp on the fear of the Lord? And during this study, he, he actually opened my eyes and let me see why. Up to now, I've taken that verse and I've gone, well, yeah, look at them. I mean, it's obvious that they've got this going on and they are you know, have the perverted mouth and this guy's got the evil way over there and that guy's got pride. That's not what it's talking about. The Holy Spirit says, Clyde, I don't want you to look outward. I want you to look inward. He said, if you find any of those things in yourself, you're to hate that. You're to hate what evil I find in myself. Whoa. Didn't see that coming. But that is to have the fear of the Lord is to look inward. And when you see something that's wrong, hate it. Don't just go, yeah, I probably should change that. That's tolerating it. Or moreover, well, I'm not ready to give that up. That's embracing it. But actually hating it. Not hating yourself. Hating the sin. Hating the evil. And I dare say that those things mentioned in that verse pride, arrogance, the evil way, and the perverted mouth I hate. I think it would be hard to come up with any sin that doesn't fall underneath of those four things. So virtually, if I find any sin in myself, in order to have the fear of the Lord in my life, I've got to view that sin and say, God, forgive me. I am wrong, and I repent. And God can then take and say, oh, I'm so glad to hear that. I have offered you cleansing and redemption and my Holy Spirit to fill the hole. I was just waiting on you. And that was, wow, what a, what a cool thing. He answered my prayer for all these years. And it's exciting. Now I can have the fear of the Lord in me at all times. So, as PPE, how does that work? Well, as I was saying earlier, if we have any sin in our life, it interrupts the flow of that which is good that we are shipping off to heaven, gold, silver, precious stones. If we have just the wrong attitude, again, it chokes it down. And we're not building God's building. We're not being the subcontractor we're supposed to be. We can't because we don't have the power to be that whenever there's something like that in our life. So, This is personal protective equipment for us because it keeps us cleansed to have the fear of the Lord in us, keeps us cleansed so we're useful as God's subcontractor in building his building. So let's see what else we can find in that tool chest. Well, oh my goodness. Oh my. This is a hot rod of a power tool. I'm just, I'm just warning you here. Let's see. Let's read the owner's man, manual here. Ah, caution. 
hold on tight. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5, 19 and 20. In Ephesians, Paul says, the Holy Spirit says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. Another verse, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, says, In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you, in Christ Jesus. I mean, it, you can't get much more clear if you're, if you're ever asking, well, what's God's will for me? His will for us is to give thanks. Now, this works as a power tool in a kind of a kind of a unique way. It's counterintuitive to what the world wants us to do. All right, it, it, give thanks in everything. Are you are you crazy? I, I just wrecked my car, and I'm supposed to give thanks for that. Yep, but it wasn't. It cost me. Yeah, and your point. God tells us, give thanks. Let's give a demonstration of that. Here we are, and we're hard at work doing this building in heaven with God. And by the way, that's exactly what we're doing. In the Spirit, we are active in the affairs of heaven by doing this building project. It says so, right, what, where we read it. So we're there building, and let's, let's kind of set it up. Let's, let's kind of, you know, like we said, step into the spirit there. Let's take a peek into it. So here we are. We're down there. We're building, and we've got this big stone we're working on, all right? And we got the hammer and chisel, and over here is the angels because the angels are watching us. And over here, there's some slithery things that are out of the powers of darkness. Now, mind you, there's three things that can be from the power of darkness. There's the demons, but there's the world, and there's the flesh, our own flesh. So all three of those are subject to the powers of darkness. So... That's why I say it's some slithery thing, because I don't know which one it is. So here we are, and we're pounding away, and we're watching and seeing what goes on. And man, you tap, tap, bang, got that on the tap, 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 bang, and tap, tap, tap. I missed. My mouth flies open, and there's this collective gasp amongst those who are watching. And they're waiting. What's he going to say? Do I let loose with expletives? Maybe even throw in a God's name in vain thing? What do I do? If I do that, if I give in to that, oh man, those powers of darkness over there, man, they're high-fiving each other and, yeah, I knew it, I knew it. One of them even hollers up to God. Hey, God, you see that? I told you he's going to do that. They're really rejoicing. Angels are standing silent. But let's back it up. Bam, bam, bam. We're working on that rock. Bam, bam, getting it off. And bam, oh, and we hit our hand. But this time, what escapes from our lips is, ouch, that hurt. Lord, that hurt. But in spite of that pain, I'm going to thank you for it. Not because it feels good, but because I'm going to make my lips praise you no matter what. I will give you 
the sacrifice of praise with my lips. And you know what happens? Them little old dark things, they slither off, and there's this resounding shout of joy. You know what it's like at a football game? Finally, they make the goal. Man, boom! The audience just roars. That's what it's like. That's the shout of joy that would come from them because we gave God praise. And you might even hear from heaven's throne, well done, my good and faithful servant. We honored God. We stepped up and we did what was right. And mind you, there's this boatload of gold, silver, and precious stones that, boom, right there, and a wall goes up with it. God makes something out of it. It's offering our praises to him no matter what. That's what makes that building continue. So there's one other thing that I think we can pull out of God's toolbox. And this is, this is really useful. You know, man thinks he's pretty clever. For a long time, we had to string extension cords to run our saws and grinders and everything, and now they're cordless. Well, that's cool. God came up with that a long time ago. Scripture says that the joy of the Lord is my strength. Well, he don't have to have us plugged in with a cord, and he gives us power. The power to do what we need to do comes from the Lord. And as we participate in it with him, we put on that protective gear of the fear of the Lord, examining our life, making sure that we're right so that we can be a good, responsible subcontractor to him. And then we get in there with that power tool of thanksgiving, and it has an accessory on it, too, that's really awesome because the two really work well together, and that accessory is called praise. So when you combine praise with thanksgiving, man, you get something that's really going to move and shake. And then when we plug in to the Lord to draw from him our strength, we can have this gift of joy. And mind you, in Ephesians it says that God has given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And it's past tense. He has given us. That's ours to possess now. It says that joy resides with him. So we can ask that he fill us with that joy so that we, as we're going forward and we're building, every minute that we're awake, we are building something in heaven. We can go with that joy and actually be that light to the others around us that will draw them to him and will be successful in our building part. You want to do the last of the songs? Yeah. <laughs>